Well, good morning. We are in uh, Proverbs chapter 20 this morning, and hopefully we will finish the 20th chapter. We are flying through this book. Scary. Did I do a good job? My goodness, what did I skip? Proverbs 20, 25. Now, I want you to um, set a tab at Psalm 139, because we will look at that in some detail this morning, along with one of our Proverbs. So we have a couple of Proverbs about a king, and I'm going to give you a little mini tutorial about the kingship of Israel and why I think we have a problem with interpreting it. Sometimes we stumble over the imprecations of the Proverbs when David says that he hates his enemies with a pure and perfect hatred. I think it's a a misunderstanding of the kingship and what he has been anointed to do. And it's something unique, and it doesn't involve us. It's Old Testament, and we are in the New Testament, and we have a different set of imperatives to live by. Okay, here's uh, 2025. A trap for a human being who speaks rashly, consecrated, you might have holy there, and after the vow to examine, uh, you might have inquire. I think that's a couple of the English translations. 26, a wise king winnows the wicked and drives a threshing wheel over them. 27, the breath, and now you may have human spirit or spirit of a man, or the lamp of the Lord, and that Lord is the covenant name, that is the voice of the burning bush, shedding light on his innermost parts. 28, kindness and reliability. You may have faithfulness and truth. They guard the king. He upholds his throne with covenant faithfulness. It's actually the word hesed that we've talked about many times. You really don't know your Old Testament unless you recognize covenant faithfulness. Faithfulness travel uh, translated 26 different ways in the Old Testament just need to recognize it. You don't need to define it. It's undefinable. That's how we know it's from above. Here is 29. The splendor, glory you may have of a young man is their strength, but the splendor, glory of the aged is their gray hair. Uh, I say blessed is the man that has some. I don't have any, so I have no glory. And then here is 30. Bruising wounds scour away evil, and blows make clean the innermost parts. Now, as I said, set a tab on Psalm 139, and here is the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs what I believe that the Proverbs are actually teaching us in a practical way. 25, the danger of impulsive words. The danger of impulsive words. 26, biblical government deals punitively with the guilty. Biblical government deals punitively with the guilty. Now, this is the Proverbs. And I use the word guilty because that means that justice has been determined. It doesn't say wickedness, it says guilty. 
And when you have people that are, have been determined to be uh, adhered, they have had a hearing and they have been found guilty, then that is the situation. Biblical government deals punitively with the guilty. 27. The attribute that leads us to worship. The attribute that leads us to worship here. 28. What the believer gives of himself, God will richly give back to him. What the believer gives of himself, God will richly give back to to him. And here's 29. Take your best and pass it on. Take your best and pass it on. And finally, 30, which would close out our 20th chapter. Bruising wounds scour away evil and blows make clean the inmost body. It's the word of God changes a man from the inside out. The word of God changes a man from the inside out. And that's the way I believe that the proverb is saying in a practical way and that's the way I'm going to teach it. Okay. Here's our exposition for the morning. A trap for a human being who speaks rashly. This is a proverb regarding the danger of speaking before thinking. And so therefore it has direct application to me more than anyone else in this room. Put your brain in gear before you put your mouth in motion. That's what my music teacher kept saying to me in elementary school. The top line here, a trap. This is the type of trap that was used by the Arabs and the Egyptians, like our current mouse trap. The victim would take the bait and the pin would fall and crush his neck. Man here, the word is ground. He is made from the dust. He is formed by the dust. So he is the common individual. Common, ordinary, everyday man. That's the point of the word. And he speaks rashly. Uh, the lexicon translates it talking wildly, out of control. That's the idea here. And line two, his talk is consecrated. Now that is, you may have holy, it's a figure for something. It's a metonymy, a figure of speech. If you go back to your, your English lit, that is M-E-T-O-N-Y-M-Y, -Y, a metonymy. We can say king, or we could say crown. That's a metonymy. We both understand them to be one in the same. Two different words, but one in the same. So here, consecrated. It stands for something that has determined to be sacred. Now that could be any set of things, propositions. For example, let's take the idea of consecrated. We don't call it a pool to be baptized. We call it a baptistry. Why? We set it apart in our language. We consecrate uh, marriage, don't we? We say, um, I pronounce you husband and wife. When God has joined together, let no man put asunder. What is that? 
We're consecrating that union. It's different. This is different than any other relationship that you have on the planet. This is your mate. That's the idea. All of that is set apart, consecrated language. Now, look at this. And after, that's the making of a vow to examine. The term occurs five times in the Proverbs. To look carefully after or into a person or a matter. The point of the proverb is now, after you've made it, you examine the vow that you made entails thinking through carefully. Do you have the ability to perform what you vowed? And how does that affect others? Those who vow should consider the cost of what they vow. That's the Old Testament idea. And oftentimes it can be a trap. The scriptures caution against vows, shackling yourself to a vow. Judges chapter 11, Jephthah made a rash vow, and he didn't think or consider the consequences, which turned out to be tragic for both he and for his daughter. The New Testament gives us all freedom. Uh, <laughs> If you want a vow, that's vow, you do it. That's between you and the Lord. It's not between me and you in instruction. You don't violate your conscience. That's the principle. Um, but my New Testament theology tells me that I just need to live daily by faith and that, frankly, I don't have the power to make vows, and keep my commitments. I just don't. Uh, I am grateful for the inspired thought of Augustine, the great thinker of grace, and his statement, command what you will, and then will what you command. Donald Gray Barnhouse simplified that down for us a bit. Whatever God requires, he's the one that provides it. That's my focus, to live by faith and to honor Him and not to go out and make spiritual commitments that I probably can't keep and don't have the power to keep. I have convictions, and I try to practice those convictions, but I don't make vows. That's me. You don't violate your conscience. Here's 26. The wise king. Now, I want to talk about the wise king for a moment. We are talking about the ideal king, and there's no such thing as an ideal king. David came the closest to it. Uh, David was the greatest monarch that ever lived, and look at his track record. He was a murderer and an adulterer. So there is no such thing as an ideal king. What you have to understand about the kingship is that they are David's words, his theology, his conviction, the Lord's anointed. God specifically chose that person, that personality, to rule and reign over men. And what do the Psalms tell us? They tell us that if a man can rule and reign over men, he must be just. And David wasn't just, but he had the office. And here is the office. That the enemies of David, whether they would be foreign or domestic, were the enemies of God because they, he put him on that throne. It's different from us. We are to love our enemies. We are to pray for our enemies. We are to do good to our enemies, and thus we pour hot coals on their heads. But not David. No, not the king. The king was the vice regent of the Lord God himself. His job was to do the will of God 
for the nation of Israel and to practice that. And that was the ideal king. Now, there was no such thing. All of these ideas are ultimately fulfilled in Messiah. So, when we look at these proverbs regarding the king, we have to think of Messiah. Now, practically speaking, how do I think of enemies today? Well, I think of myself. I'm my own worst enemy. I am constantly in a spiritual warfare. I'm in a daily battle. And that's the way I look at it. And that's the way I think of my flesh. I hate my flesh. The very thing that I want to do, I don't do. Uh, I look at it that way. Satan is the ultimate enemy. That's the way I think of the imprecations. But back then, when David wrote these things as the king, he was in political warfare. And he was the magistrate for God. And to oppose him is to oppose the will of God who established him. David understood that. That's why he wouldn't touch Saul, and he called him the Lord's anointed. Now, that's a little tutorial about the king. Now, here, the ideal king sets his throne against evildoers, and he's going to use his considerable resources to destroy them. The king, the vice-regent, is going to function in the place of God being the moral authority in that time and place. Notice the imagery here. Winnowing and threshing. Israel was predominantly an agricultural economy. So we open the top line with the wise king. He's the subject of both lines. The first image, winnowing, throwing the grain in the air with a fork, and it separates the grain from the chaff. The king, by ruling in righteousness, he separates the good from the evil. He separates the righteous from the wicked. That's his job as king. His desire is to rid his kingdom of the guilty. That would be the people who have been judged to be guilty. Line two, he drives... This word is interesting, literally cause to return. Now I'm going to give it to you and you will never forget it because it's used in a place that's very common to you. Genesis 42, 34. Joseph, who was the strong man down in Egypt, talking to his brothers on their first visit. You remember he keeps Simeon. And he says to the other brothers, you must bring Benjamin back or else you get no more grain. And here is the verb that he uses. Our verb right here. Return to me only with your youngest brother. The word is used of plowing. You plow a furrow and then you plow it again you return, it comes back again. That is this word to drive. It doesn't seem to relate to us in the Western world, but that's the word. And the second image, the wheel here. Always used of a wheel or a cart or a chariot. It's a heavy wheel rolling over grain to crush it. That's the idea. And the last two words, over them. Likens the wicked to chaff. Separating the husk from the actual seed itself. They are of no value. They've been condemned. They are guilty. And therefore, they deserve in a righteous kingdom to be crushed. The king crushes the guilty his righteous rule prevails over them. It's a picture of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah himself, who will be coming, and he will be establishing his kingdom, and he is 
the King of Kings, John said. And here's the way John the Baptizer, the final prophet of the Old Testament, described him. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And so it's ultimately about Messiah. It's about moral governance. And when a country has good moral governance, then it will be successful. And to the extent that it doesn't, then we go to the proverb, righteousness exalts a nation, sin is a reproach to any land. Here's 27. Now here is where we're going to look at Psalm 139 in just a moment. So keep your thumb right there. Here is the breath. Your translation probably reads, human spirit, spirit of man, are the lamp. The Lord who guides this proverb, he is guiding us to the ideal king who knows his every thought and his motive. Our top line represents this incommunicable attribute called omniscience. I don't need to describe and explain omniscience. I'm at Believer's Chapel. You all know more omniscience than I do. The figure that Solomon uses here is the lamp. The lamp of the Lord. Now, we want to emphasize more than the figure of the lamp. We want to emphasize the covenant name. I want to continue to pound the table about this covenant name. It cannot be defined. It cannot be explained. It comes from the verb to be. It means, well, it means the proverbial glass blower. He looks at the young man who's paid his fee for whatever he's going to make, and he says, what do you want? You want a dog? You want a balloon? You want an airplane? That's this verb. He is undefinable. He can't be explained, and he rules, takes residence, and controls history. Line two, the interpretation of the proverb is line two. So let's go to line one first. The breath, God breathed into man's nostrils. He became a living being. That's our word, Genesis 2-7. That's the idea of spirit here. Spirit in the English translation. Now the figure of the lamp. It also refers to human life. It is the figure for human life. We know that because it's connected to the covenant name. The covenant name. The one that knows the beginning from the end. The one that spoke to the darkness and told it to become light. Different name as Elohim then. But this is the covenant name that builds a relationship with us all. He is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's the giver of life. The lamp, the light, Genesis 1, the one who said, let there be light. Now the interpretation, line 2. Shedding light. The idea of searching out. Making a complete and thorough search of something. Uh, used in Genesis 31-35, when Laban was rummaging through the tents of Jacob, searching, searching in light for his little idols. That's the word, and that's where it's used. It's the idea of looking into the inmost parts. You know, we say, we want transparency. We talk about daylight. Everything we want out in the open. Well, that's this word, and that's this idea. Now, look in this innermost parts. The word is literally belly, meaning deep inside, the deepest 
layer of tissue of the person. Deepest layer, down deep. The point is, God knows it. His omniscience is there. He knows it. He sees it. Nothing is hidden from His sight. Now, look at Psalm 139. The Proverbs are going to teach us the psalm. The psalm is going to teach us this proverb. For the director of music of David, a psalm. Verse 1, you have searched me, known me, Lord. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You discern my attention, my intentions from afar. Sitting down, rising up. Look at that. Two extremes. Sitting, standing, rising. And the idea of the figure is everything in between. So you know everything about me. Sitting, rising, and all in between. You search out my path, my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. Even all your English translations have this word, even. Uh, the King James translates it when, making it a circumstance. It's not a new thought. It is exactly tied in directly, coterminous with the first line. And it explains it to us. That's why the even is so important here. Before a word is on my tongue, indeed, or behold, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before you place your palm over me. Now, that's what Proverbs 20:27 20, has just told us. He's told us that God is omniscient. Nothing is hidden. He sees it all. He knows it all. So the question that we want to pose to ourselves in a practical way, what does this knowledge of this incommunicable, not relating to us, this incommunicable attribute, what effect did it have on David? Because that's what I want to know. What effect did it have on him? Because it should have the same effect upon me. And here's the answer. Worship. He's in awe. It's completely beyond his ability to understand. Verse 6, too wonderful for me. Beyond human comprehension. Unattainable. I like Alan Ross, the real mean scholar from the uh, Hebrew language. He says, the idea is, it's so far out there. I mean, we, we say that the universe, it, it just, it's so massive, we can't quantify it. Well, it's nothing compared to to the omniscience of God. It's way beyond the universe. It's incredible. And here, here's the effect it had on David. This is what I want to know. Look at his clothes, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me, know my anxious thought. See if there is a wicked way in me. Now, Roy Orbison said, if you want to have a hit, you have to have a surprise and a song. Well, David's psalm here surprises me. May not surprise you, but surprised me. Because I would think that David would say something because he, God knows him, knows his thoughts, knows his sitting down, is uprising, knows everything in between, knows it all, that I would think <coughs> David would say something like, forgive me, cleanse me, because you know how dirty I am. But he doesn't do that. This is the surprise. Look at his final request. His final request is from the moment he picked up that pen off the paper. He says, lead me 
in the everlasting way. That is on and on and on. Let me give you a visual of it. That makes David a traveler on the Emmaus road that never gets to Emmaus. It just goes on and on and on and on. Kalen Oliphant was pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Amarillo. He was a very good thinker, scholar, and he was asked to go back to his seminary, Westminster in Philadelphia, and take over the chair of the great Cornelius Van Til, who, if you are listening to Jeff, you are getting acquainted with his thinking. And Ken Oliphant said he would, Van Til in his retirement, they would mark out a two-mile walk, and they would go on this walk together a couple of times a week. And he described it this way. It was like no time at all. I, I would ply him with questions. He would have answers We would have discussion, more him talking than me talking, me listening. And it was over. It was like we didn't, when did we start? It happened so fast. You see, that is the everlasting way. That's what David's talking about. We are listening to him, we're studying him, we're absorbing him. We are pondering Him and it fills our mind and it is like nothing at all. And so, we tie it back to our Proverbs 13.20. Walk with wise and you'll be wise. Here's 28. Kindness and reliability. Your translation, faithfulness and truth. Look at this, guard. Your translation may have keep, may have preserve, may have watch over. The word is to guard. It guards the king. He upholds his throne with kindness or covenant loyalty. Now, our top line, kindness and reliability. The lexicon translates this as loyalty extended to the lowly. See, the king is lowly compared to God, and we are lowly compared to the king. The king is to practice kindness, justice, goodness to the needy, and be merciful in all things. And The proverb says that guards. The word means to protect. It means to defend. And that is what he is to do to the weak as well. That's Psalm 41. Here it is. Blessed is the one who has regard. That verb means to behave wisely, skillfully, and we are to do it to the weak. To the weak. And here's the promise of the song. As we do that, the Lord will deliver us from the day of trouble. So there's a reciprocal effect upon it. So here's why I call this the proverb that has a perfect circle. What you practice is what you receive. As the king guards the needy, the weak, line two, likewise his throne is guarded, upheld with covenant loyalty. Look at this word, upholds. It's a reference to the king and to his subjects. It's uphold. It means to maintain someone or something. Now, you already know this verb because you've heard it and you've repeated it from the Old Testament over and over and over again. 
It's Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government, and here's our verb, upholds. He is going to put the government on his shoulders, says Isaiah. That's our word. That's the Messiah in his kingdom to come. And he's going to carry it. And he is strong enough to do so. Proverbs 20, 20, to uphold. That is the work of Messiah. And he does it with covenant loyalty. The throne of the ideal king is protected and strength because of God's loyalty to him. The Lord supports the faithful king and he keeps him safe. 2 Samuel 7. Back to this idea of the king from the Old Testament. The Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel 7 It's all built on covenant loyalty. 2 Samuel 7, 15, the Lord says, But my hesed, my covenant loyalty, will not depart from him as I did to Saul. Now, why did he depart from Saul? Well, Saul was never a believer. Saul got the kingship and he said, well, this this fits me perfectly. This is my day. Uh, Congratulations for finding me. I knew I was great. My mother told me I would be great and I'm destined to be great. It's all about me. He spit in God's face. David saw it as covenant loyalty and understood it that way. He had to be the hands, the feet, the eyes of the living God himself. And that was his practice of covenant loyalty. The ideal king, his throne, is sustained by God. What is the greatest thing then that you and I, because we don't live in the time of the king, we are believers in the New Testament. What is taking these ideas and bring him over into our lives as members of his church, believers. What are we to do? Well, here it is. We are to practice righteousness. Every day, we are to look upon the weak and the needy, and we are to be a blessing to them. And we are to serve them, counting others, said the apostle, better than ourselves. And what's the result? Full circle. You're going to be made strong. You're going to have your head together. You're going to really understand what this life is all about. Not about you. It's about Him. And we, His servants of a great King, a regal King, we are His Indentured servants, bond servants, said the apostle, forever and ever. And that's real thinking. That's righteous. Now, here's 29. The splendor glory of a young man is their strength, but the splendor glory of the aged is their gray hair. A proverb that compares the old to the young here. The assets from one versus the assets of another. The comparisons of generations. The opening of the top line, splendor, translated in the lexicon as ornament. An ornament. We've actually seen this word before back in chapter 4 and verse 9, and there we understood it to be an ornate crown, a beautiful crown that's set upon the head of a king. That's the idea, something high, something visible, something that would be immediately noticeable. Now, here for the young, the youth, what is it? It's their natural strength, their vitality. Used in chapter 5, warning the son to stay away from the wayward woman because here's what the parents say will happen to you. 
She will take your natural ability, the greatest asset you have as a young man, your strength, she'll sap it from you. I've said across from too many men who have been involved in affairs. They are a mess. They couldn't tell you north from south, east from west. They are emotionally strung out. They are in conflict. They can't think straight. They have no strength or ability because all their strength has been sapped from them. I've seen it. Here's line two, the glory splendor of the aged. That's when aged, when we begin to fail in physical strength, ache, pains, weakness. That's the word. It needs no explanation with me. I have it. Gray hair, a physical feature that implies wisdom, skill, spirituality through life experiences. My parents had a certain mindset as I was growing up because they lived through the Depression. You have heard people talk about World War II and living through that. Uh, Tom Brokaw called it the greatest generation. They had a level of maturity at 18, 19, and 20 that very few have to this day because of their experiences. Getting close to S. Lewis Johnson, as the Lord gave me the opportunity to do in the late 70s, and all of those years of study that he had, filling his mind with God's Word. And what I learned by being close to him was his appreciation for it. The content of the Word, it thrilled him. It delighted him. He thought about it all the time. And he was constantly thinking about an argument for this and for that based upon what he had learned from the Scriptures. It consumed him. And for me, that was transformative. Not what he taught me in content, but his appreciation, his zeal as a man much older and much wiser. So, here's my exhortation. And with this, I'll close. What are you doing with your days? We've got so many young people that we need to be ministering to, that we need to be building into. And you are perfectly qualified to do it. So get with it. There is ministry abounding everywhere. Do it. Teach them. Speak to them. Encourage them in wisdom. You can't have a parade, said Will Rogers, unless somebody stands on the curb and claps. Well, you know what I do? I stand on the curb and clap for all the people that God gives me an opportunity to minister to. Just helping them along, encouraging them, trying to be a blessing. Ministry in every way I possibly can. That's what I do. That's what this proverb is calling us to do. Build into the lives of other people. And for the elderly, the lives of younger people particularly. And that's the proverb. We didn't finish to get to 21. We'll do that, Lord willing, next time. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank you, Father, for these, your people, who love your word and desire to know it. Fill their minds with the skill for living, wisdom. Give them guidance and direction that they may live productive lives filled with the knowledge of God. Emmaus travelers forever with you. In Jesus' name, amen.